continuation from the um, uh, information I gave you of the last OpenStat user group meeting. Uh, but for people who don't know us, um, my name is Chris Bingham, I'm from the Datalinks group. Uh, Datalinks group specializes in uh, IT systems for regulatory compliance industries, primarily uh, places like pharmaceuticals and banking. Uh, in Switzerland, we're divided into a few different sub companies. Uh, we've got Advice Links, who actually do the regulatory compliance aspects, all of the um, quality management, quality, and that kind of things. Secure Links, I think the name is pretty self explanatory, ISEC type stuff. Uh, Process Links, who do sort of design, build, maintenance of uh, applications and systems. Prime Track, who do support and operations, and then the newest member of our group, part of uh, myself and a couple of colleagues here today are from, Cloudlinks. Datalinks Group, uh, we've got offices in the Americas, in Asia, in Europe, uh, about eight or nine countries around the world, with about 200 people in total right now. So uh, what are we doing with Cloudlinks, uh, for those of you who weren't here last time? We're building a regulatory compliant public infrastructure as a service provider. Uh, the goal here is to offer cloud services which are fully suitable for use in heavily regulated applications. To that end, we're going to make it highly resilient. It's distributed across three data centers here in Switzerland, uh, currently around the Zurich area. Basing it on OpenStack, uh, particularly uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform, uh, gives us an open source publicly documented API, so no vendor locking by using this. Uh, we'll be offering charging models that support both OPEX and CAPEX styles of payment, so traditional pay-as-you-go and upfront subscriptions. We'll be open to anybody. All you'll need to use is a PayPal account. And uh, lastly, and a big one, big differentiator for us on the uh, regulatory compliance side is that we will allow full vendor audits. So when we say we have regulatory compliance, or that we are compliant for certain standards, you don't have to take our word for it. We will let you come and inspect our operations and determine that for yourself. Uh, that's actually a big prerequisite if you want to do regulatory compliant type stuff, particularly things like, um, for instance, GXP compliant applications for drug developers for drug distribution. So what's the current status of the project? Um, last time, I said we were under construction, various walls were rolling, well, we're still under construction. But now we've got our new company, Cloudlinks, so the legal entity set up. And our hardware, the first batch, is in the data centers. We are planning to release what we're calling a tech preview, otherwise known as a beta, um, in the next sort of three or four weeks. Uh, that will be based on OpenStack Havana, uh, Red LSP version 4, a few other pieces. And we're currently targeting a full release, productive release, with all the regulatory compliance rolled in for uh, end of September, early October this year. So what's changed since the last time I spoke to some of you? Actually? Well, for our production release, we've decided we're going to have to switch to Icehouse to Rel OSP5. And the big driver for this for us is uh, a little project I'm not sure if anybody will have heard of, um, I hadn't heard of it until a few weeks ago, uh, called StayPuft. StayPuft is quite nice. It's a plugin for Foreman or for Red Hat Satellite 6, which is based on Foreman 1.5, but also <coughs> it's the deployment and provisioning of OpenStack clouds. Um, obviously it's using the OpenStack puppet modules to do that, but it's the first tool we've seen that includes all of the high availability stuff. So it can deploy fully distributed HA architectures. Um, that's taking away a lot of work from us, uh, which enables us to focus more on the security and compliance aspects we want to. No news here. The gentleman from Exascale mentioned it earlier, but we're going to look at using the uh, ELK stack, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Cabana for our monitoring. So I'll just kind of skip that since we talked about it earlier. Uh, another thing that's changed for us is, and this may sound a bit boring, but our, our project management methodology. 
if you've worked in regulatory compliant industries before, you'll know of things like the V model, uh, which dictates how you go about designing and deploying systems to comply with regulations. These sort of, the V model systems like it are ultimately waterfall deployments. You start with some specifications and you go through a whole very long process and deploy a massive big chunk of functionality in one big hit at the end. And we started out with uh, what's become Cloudlinks following this standard model because that's the easiest way to make sure you're regulatory compliant, follow the predetermined path set out by regulators. Um, but as I, I like to say to our management, in the last 12 months we've successfully proved that that's too slow. In other words, if you've been following this for a while, you've noticed we've missed a couple of uh, planned release dates. It's because, as it turns out, waterfall models for compliance with OpenStack systems just can't keep pace with the rate at which OpenStack progresses. So we're doing something that's um, not often done. And this is considering we've got about 30 or 40 people whose sole job is to do regulatory compliance for IT and have collectively hundreds of years of experience in it which is to abandon the V-model and the waterfall and move to an agile approach. We're actually uh, basically sort of scrum, since we've got some scrum masters in the company as well. Uh, the goal here is to be more iterative in our deployment methodology uh, and how we build the system. And hopefully this will accelerate things for us. Uh, so that's kind of a lesson learned if you're trying to do regulatory compliant cloud. Don't do waterfalls. Uh, we've also um, started to expand a bit on something I briefly touched on last time, which is our plans for private cloud products. Uh, we want to be able to offer, in conjunction to our public cloud offering, a near, as near as possible identical, fully API compatible private cloud offering, which has the same regulatory compliance uh, features. For this, we're now planning to offer a uh, sort of one-box desk size system for development of proof of concept type approaches, uh, and then sort of larger multi-rack based modular systems uh, for production deployments in companies. And then there's a couple of uh, points I'm going to elaborate on in a bit more detail. And the first is that our plans have gone a bit bigger. Now, I know we've the guy from Exascale said earlier that all public cloud providers tend not to talk about how big their systems are because when the smaller ones of us, Cloudlinks, Exascale, talk about how big we are, we look tiny in comparison to everybody else. But one of the factors of being auditable is that you're going to have to release this information anyway in order to be audited. So what the hell? I'm going to tell you. So what happened with getting bigger? Well, originally, as I said last time, we figured 500, 1,000 nodes, that kind of size. Between the last user group meeting and this one, uh, we had a person who represents all of our investors come in and check our map. Uh, he went through all of our numbers, our business case, our business model, etc., and he came back and he said, you've got your maps wrong. And everybody's sort of part dropped the door, <laughs> this is going to be bad. But he said, you need to add a zero to all of them. <laughs> so now we're, we're targeting to have in the next 18 months or so about 5,000 nodes in total. Uh, we're looking at a couple of different ratios of storage to compute, but the sort of goal is to have around 90,000 cores physical. Um, so what was the rationale behind uh, like, uh, selecting another zero? Did he think it was just too small to, to be by <laughs> uh, Well, the, the numbers of nodes are derived from our sales projections, business case, all that kind of stuff. Ah, okay. The guy looked at all of this and said, you, you've got the decimal place in the wrong place. <laughs> and this you're going to have this amount of nodes, regulated ones? Or? Regulated. The whole system, fully regulatory compliant. GXP, uh, eventually ISO 27001, if you've done that, you know it takes a couple of years to do the audit, so we won't have that on day one, but we'll be building toward it. And ISO 9001 to start. We also plan to go for the EU's uh, data privacy uh, regulations compliance certification, potentially the Swiss version of that as well, and then move out into banking regulations in the mid to long term. So yeah, so 90,000 cores, uh, we're looking at 120, 170 petabyte storage array in the same time scale. 
Uh, and when you multiply this out into physical terms, several hundred racks, and we're trying to be quite dense on the power, sort of 10 to 12 kilowatts per rack is our target, which multiplies out at something around the four to four and a half megawatts total power, which is quite a nice size, and a very big electricity bill. So then on the storage side, last time I talked about how we were using Gluster uh, for storage, specifically Red Hat's uh, pre-packaged product, Red Hat Storage Server. Uh, if you've been watching the news around Ceph, you may have noticed that Ink Tank are now being bought by Red Hat. And Red Hat's, uh, are, well, shall I say, our spies in Red Hat have uh, told us, well, you know, once that's complete, there's going to be a change of strategy. Uh, Gluster is going to be refocused primarily as file storage, and we're going to use Ceph for all the blocking object for OpenStack. So in the short term, we're sticking with Gluster because Ink Tank acquisition by Red Hat isn't finished yet. In the mid to long term, we plan to switch to Ceph. And this is where I'm kind of hoping I can uh, do a bit of crowdsourcing, shall we say, for an ex experience, because I know there are some people who have deployed Ceph before. So what we're thinking of in terms of Ceph nodes is to start with a configuration like this. Uh, so about 240 terabytes per node of raw disk space, stick the journals on some nice, fast, uh, write-intensive SSDs, um, OS on the nice mirror, lots of calls, lots of RAM, and about 20 gigabits of network bandwidth per node. And then we plan to deploy, to start with, first iteration of the set cluster will be about 10 to 14 of these nodes across three, three data centers. So the storage nodes will be in two primary data centers, for set months will be three data centers for geographic uh, And then grow back to five to 700 nodes. With, uh, we're looking at a ratio of, sort of one to six to one to eight set to node nodes. So I'd be very interested to hear if anybody has any uh, comments, like maybe nuts, please stop. I wouldn't uh, put that many disks in one sort of Okay, may I ask? Because you're, you're chunking your failure things. Yes, I get where you're going. Um, I did actually kind of think about that. And initially, I was quite concerned because ordinarily you think if you lose a server, that's a large, that's that bit, it's a large proportion of your data you have to re replicate somewhere. And then I thought, well, if we're going to deploy 700 of them, right. <laughs> one of these things is actually quite a small proportion. Um, I'm not sure if that's a good idea or not still. Does anybody have any experience with set on this kind of scale? Uh, no, we've deployed set on a small scale, like more experimental part, please understand its performance against, for example, Swift object storage. Uh, not on this scale, but the question uh, is uh, your data centers, what kind of connectivity do you have between them? That's a very good question, and we have a very good answer. Uh, right now, we have, between all three data centers, uh, layer two connections at 10 gigabits with sub millisecond latency. Uh, we obviously, over time, plan to ramp that up. We've got the potential to go to several hundred gigabits between the two main data centers with the box and the bottom of the nodes. Are. Again, layer two or dark fiber, sub millisecond latency. Um, for our full production release, we will speaking to a supplier of network hardware about our big routers and switches, we're looking at stuff in like a multi-terabit per second backplane uh, for the core of the network, the spine of the network. Uh, and then it, when we run over dark fiber, of course, we just plumb that into the switches and whatever comes out of the port of the transceiver is what we get on the fiber. So theoretically, hundreds of gigabits in multi-terabits we can achieve. And can, you have a, oh, sorry. Sorry, no, can you have a public and a private network as they recommend uh, so like for the creation of replicas you use the private one and then you expose the monitors on the public one? Yeah, we, we're planning to separate out the network with VLANs uh, to a large extent. Um, so on layer two it should be one consistent big fat pipe is the idea. Um, like I said, we're doing to start with 20 gigabits to each node, we'll probably wrap that up in terms of 40 or more, you know, whatever we can get in fiber optic transfer.
kind of see this when the time comes. Um, so yeah, at the moment we're looking at doing that with VLANs rather than physically segregated. And you, did you, did you, did you like uh, get in touch with uh, Intec? Not yet. Uh, I tried to, but I didn't get any reply. I guess we're a bit busy being required. <laughs> Uh, but once we're ah, right. bought out by Red Hat, yes. we have a very, very close relationship with Red Hat. Yeah. Um, because uh, I'm hearing that they are really you know, interested in, in such cases, mm -hmm. and you know, they, they, they like to you know, collaborate. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. We, we've got a very good collaboration going on with Red Hat. One thing I didn't mention, about because not want to sort of show up too much, uh, stay part. Uh, about a year ago, we were raising lots of concerns with Red Hat about HN deployments and were suggesting ways it could be resolved. Stay Pump is pretty close to what we were talking about a year ago. So is that something that Red Hat is developing now? Red Hat as an open source project. So like Red Hat's developers are the main ones behind Foreman, they're also the main ones behind Stay Pump. Uh, we obviously weren't the only ones making that comment that the deployment the story needed to be better, uh, but it's I've got to say, it's, it's like pretty much exactly what we asked for, so very pleased. <laughs> um, okay, any other comments, questions? Okay, so to give you a quick final finish off rundown of our midterm architecture when we move to set, this is what we're thinking of. Um, so we're going to separate out some of the persistent stuff, the queues and the databases, from the main controller nodes. Uh, and then, hopefully, as uh, Neutron in particular ensures it becomes less, or sorry, more um, horizontally scalable, our control nodes then become stateless, scalable things we can just add more on that information. Um, on the set side, as I said, we're looking at maybe three to five, we're thinking, set nodes to begin with, uh, distributed across three data centers. This is so that we have a, a geographic quorum. So, you know, if a plane lands on one of the data centers, we can carry on functioning with the remaining two, whichever one of this will lose. Yeah, and then lots and lots of compute nodes on the two main ones. Okay, so, if you want to get into the um. What what's your basis for, for of the company? Or how many people are you, and where do you come from? <laughs> okay, so DataLinks Group overall is about two hundred people, um, spread across about eight or nine countries from many more countries than I can remember right now. Uh, the actual team that's working on this, um, if you count all of the areas, the you know sales, communications, etc., service development. We're looking at, um, I think it's about 20 or 25 people right now. The technical team is currently, including myself, four people, but we've got three more people starting in the next few uh, couple of weeks. Um, as I kind of commented on this last time, it turns out that hiring these sort of people with these sorts of skills in Switzerland is very challenging. <laughs> um, so it's been a, a long process for the getting so basically, you're starting that the, the Cloud Linux, uh, Cloud Links, uh, base in Switzerland. You're starting from scratch. Yeah. Well, Cloud Links is in the Data Links group, so it benefits from all of the pre-existing structure that exists in the, the mothership. If you yes, but the, uh, the the idea was to create the. It was a, a business decision to create a regulatory cloud in Switzerland, and then you started. Yeah. Yes, we started about a year ago actually, pretty much this time last year. Um, back then it was just sort of business plans and spreadsheets and uh, non-technical, can we do this kind of stuff. Uh, technical work started completing the last September uh, with me part-time. Uh, then we got Chris, my colleague, who's actually sat here in front of me. Um, and we've been expanding from there ever since. In fact, I can just very briefly show you, just to prove this isn't all hot air, <laughs> courtesy of Chris, who works for weekends to get 
set preview 80, 90% of the way finished. So there's Horizon for our tip. Yeah, that's a disaster. I don't know.